Access to affordable and sustainable energy for all is one of the goals the United Nations aim to achieve by 2030. For industrialized countries, this means they need to reduce their energy consumption. But how can we successfully achieve a fair energy transition that avoids disadvantages to anyone? And what does gender have to do with that? In this context, two issues are particularly important. First, decision-makers in the energy sector are predominantly male, as the proportion of women in this field is no more than 22%, in the upper echelons as little as 10%. Yet we know from research that women are more likely to consider the environment and social issues instead of focusing on technological aspects or economic gain only. A higher participation of women in the energy sector might therefore constitute an asset in achieving environmental targets. Incidentally, no data on other genders has been collected so far to reveal their participation or interests. Secondly, Gender also plays a role in policies in the energy sector. How? In the industrialized countries, the two major energy consumers are traffic and industry, followed by private households. However, there are few policies regarding energy efficiency measures for industry and traffic. Is it possible the main energy consumers are under-regulated because these are strongly male-dominated fields? Because things are very different for households. Here, research is conducted in order to achieve a change in consumer behavior. New technologies and incentive systems are being developed. This means, for example, time-variable tariff models that cause household activities with high energy consumption to be postponed to the hours where there is a surplus of solar and wind power, for example, when electricity is least expensive. This causes inequalities. In most cases, domestic work is not shared equally between men and women. Such energy-saving measures in households thus often lead to increasing the workload of women. Another policy is to provide tax incentives for buying new, energy-saving technologies. Here, another key factor in households besides gender is income. Wealthy people are better able to afford new technologies than poor households. While rich households have the highest energy consumption, poorer households, on the other hand, are often energy poor. This means they have a very low income with higher than average energy expenses. This is hardly surprising considering that poorer people very often also live in poorly insulated buildings. Even today, around 50 million households in the EU cannot afford an adequate energy supply. <coughs> energy poverty disproportionately affects single mothers and pensioners. In conclusion, this means that existing policies to reduce energy consumption are exasperating existing inequalities instead of countering them. This is where important research questions arise. In a research project, who defines the priorities given to the environment, to society and to risk considerations? which segments of the population benefit from a policy and which do not? How does a proposed policy affect the different genders in the first place? Are other attributes relevant, for instance age, occupation, wealth, family and geographical location? It is important to address these issues now that we stand at the beginning of the energy transition because they are the key to a fair reduction of our energy consumption. The starting point of any research in this field should be what kind of world do we want to live in? <laughs>